Hi, I'm Ryan Fallon. I'm a senior customer success architect here at HashiCorp. And this is a rundown of common use cases that we see for Vault as it relates to zero trust. Okay, so as I just mentioned, uh, we're gonna be focusing on Vault today. Now, this may seem like a lot, but it's actually fairly simple. Uh, and we're gonna talk through actual workflows about how to consume Vault within your environments. And so Vault in its simplest form is really just what I consider to be three things. Um, on the left-hand side uh, are authentication methods. Uh, that's your source identity, effectively the mechanism to prove your identity with Vault. Uh, and on the right-hand side are secrets engines. Um, and you can think of those as your destination identities. When we think about secrets management, it's, it's really just a mapping of identities. I have an identity on one side and I need an identity on the other side. So how do we go about brokering that access with the various technologies that we have? And this bottom section of the diagram is really about, it's, it's really the secure piece of Vault. Here we have policy management that's tied to any of the identities that you have. Policies are denied by default. So if anybody, somebody, somebody logs into Vault, we don't give them access to anything unless they're explicitly allowed through those sets of policies. And again, uh, we'll work through those workflows in the various sort and the various sort of secrets engines uh, that you all might be consuming, uh, as well as some of the authentication methods out there uh, that we find to be very popular with our customers today. Okay, uh, so let's start off with the basic one, uh, key value or KV secrets engine for short. So in its simplest form, almost everybody comes to us and they want to secure a username and password for an application. Uh, if you're lucky, that username and password, it, it's, it's encrypted while at rest. Uh, if you're not, it's in plain text and it's hiding somewhere out there. Um, it's not unknown to have, even in the financial sector, tens of thousands of secrets published uh, in your version control systems. And so the way this diagram works is at the very top, we have the interactions with Vault. Uh, in the middle layer, we have the two applications, uh, application A and B. And generally speaking, B is probably some sort of data source like a database and you're reading data from and writing data to uh, the stuff on the right. Uh, but keep in mind, this could just as easily be applications uh, that are the data sources and uh, the bottom layer represents where your applications are actually hosted in the context of this diagram. Uh, in this particular case, we have an application that's running in AWS and a database that is running inside of your data center. So the very first step in terms of pro uh, proving out the identity is to actually receive that identity. And in AWS, identity and access management, or IAM for short, is generally the way that folks uh, will get an identity for their systems. It comes for free. It's very simple to create fine-grained roles and associated policies against those roles. And so Vault has an AWS auth method, which allows you to prevent, present that IAM credential to Vault, uh, which is what's being done here. Uh, Vault then reaches back out to AWS and actually verifies uh, that the identity that you've proved is who you say it is. Next is where the scoping within Vault comes into play. And you can see the key at the bottom of the diagram. Uh, and that's where Vault returns a token and the tokens are scoped with some set of policies. Uh, the default deny rule at the bottom is there just to highlight that that's always there. Uh, you don't actually have to explicitly define a deny when you talk to Vault. So just realize that that comes for free. Um, the next piece is that you're giving access to some kind of path within Vault. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we have a KV mount point secret engine with a path for application B, and we're reading that password uh, or credentials or whatever it is that you're storing at that path. Uh, below that is the TTL or time to live, and every vault token has a customizable TTL that defaults usually to around a month. Uh, but you can bring that down to small values on the order of seconds. So as you're starting to think about your security posturing, and how long your secrets live and how long access to those secrets live, the TTL gives you some flexibility about how to, about being able to create different windows uh, for different secrets and different secret types. Uh, and once again, it's customizable by the authentication method that you use, 
So you can actually have administrators with long-lived tokens, and you can have applications with very short-lived tokens if necessary. Okay, so the next piece, now that I have a token, is the client can go out to Vault and say, hey, uh, I need this particular secret at a particular path. Um, there are many ways of doing this. We have templating mechanisms. Uh, you can do direct API calls. Uh, don't worry, above, um, this isn't a fully fleshed out API call. Uh, the first line is just an example of the path that we're trying to access. Uh, on the second line, I added the Vault token uh, inside of there, just so that you know. Uh, if you're going to be sending your own API requests to Vault, just realize that you have to add the token in there. You can get around this by using Vault Agent or some other select tools, which typically uh, includes the token for you. But in the event that you decide to go the route of writing your own API calls uh, or using another library, just, just realize that you have to pass that token with every request to Vault to ensure that you get the data back from it. Okay, um, so the next piece is that Vault is going to check that your policy allows the requesting identity access, uh, in this case, to the slash KV slash B slash password path. And if it does, Vault will return that data. Uh, this username A password 42 is kind of a simple example of what might be contained inside of here. Uh, one thing I generally suggest, and whether you do this or not is a matter of style, uh, but I like people to put their usernames inside of the key value store as well. Uh, because if you don't actually have the username as part of the path, it's helpful to put in there uh, when you're trying to troubleshoot things and validate that you're actually logging in properly. Uh, okay, so at this stage, Vault has returned my username and password to my application. And now my application can use that data to connect directly to the application on the distant end. So Vault isn't in the middle of the actual transaction. It's just providing you with the secret. And along this arrow, we see kind of a kind of simplified API request. So login with username equals A, password equals 42. And now you should have secure communication between you and your app, uh, app you, basically between your applications. Um, now we don't automate the versioning of basic KV for you, but some patterns do exist that allow you to do that. All right, perfect. Um, so we've just covered a basic KV pattern. Uh, that we find. And this highlights the bread and butter of Vault and why many folks come to us uh, really to start off. So where things really start to get interesting with Vault is in some of the more dynamic capabilities that we have. And I'm going to talk through database patterns here, but we also do this for clouds. Uh, so while this example covers dynamic database credentials, you can also get dynamic cloud credentials. Uh, so what we're about to cover here regarding database credentials extends to capabilities like checking out credentials or creating them on the fly. Now, this diagram should look somewhat familiar um, from our previous KV workflow. And this will be a theme <laughs> throughout the rest of the use cases. All of these workflows are fairly similar uh, with some minor variations in terms of the amount and types of steps. Uh, but speaking to the diagram, Kubernetes, obviously a very plat popular platform these days. Uh, Kubernetes will give you a JOT token uh, with any of your service accounts that you, uh, that you run your applications in. And those are generally scoped in some kind of a namespace. So that combination of namespace and service account is what's contained inside the JOT token. Uh, and that's the identity that we use for verifying your identity uh, for Kubernetes inside of Vault. Okay, so the next step, obviously is going to be presenting that JOT token to Vault. And then Vault again is going to reach back in using the token verify process uh, within Kubernetes and then verify the identity that I've given uh, through that particular JOT token. Assuming that of course uh, that thing is okay, I'll get another Vault token. And so you may notice down at the bottom here, uh, the allow is a little bit different because I have a slightly different path. Uh, don't get hung up on the fact that it's just a singular path. You can actually include multiple policies against an authentication method. So if you needed access to that KV secret uh, from the previous example, as well as a database secret, whoever's doing your administration just needs to make sure that you get multiple policies based on your required access. Um, we're not going to dive into administrative workflows today, uh, but those workflows are very well documented on HashiCorp's website. Okay, so I've got my token. 
Now I'm going to make a request to a slightly different path. Again, passing the token with my request. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to read the uh, from database B, and I'm going to read schema A because, hey, I'm the A application. So where things get a little bit different with the dynamic secrets capability is the fact that Vault requires some kind of administrator access to the database if you're going to use this particular technology. And so in this stage, Vault is creating a unique username and password combination on each request that it gets for a database password. It's effectively a dynamic password, which we achieve by assigning some kind of TTL uh, to that particular password. And so what it's actually going to do is it's going to reach out to the database. It's going to create the username and password combination. Uh, and it also has some policy information in there. I just didn't put that information in uh, this diagram. But you have any of your select data, update data, or whatever kind of SQL statements that you're going to allow for this particular role. Uh, and it'll associate that with the role or username that you've created. Uh, associate that password with it, and then create a TTL in this case of 60 minutes. So that means that at 60 minutes, this credential is actually going to be removed from the system and will no longer be valid. And so when you have the concept of being able to roll or rotate your passwords, this actually removes the need for that because you're creating these credentials on the fly. And as a result, they automatically, as a result of the TTL, they automatically expire. Um, so when my application needs a new set of credentials at any time in the future, I can simply go and grab those back. Uh, there are also way, some ways within Vault uh, that you can reaffirm your credentials for a, a set period of time. So if that's part of your pattern, uh, you want people to be able to renew them for say a month or a week or something like that, uh, we're flexible enough to allow for that kind of pattern as well. Okay, so we're gonna return those credentials back to the application, again, uh, assuming that I have the proper policy. Uh, and then the application will go through whatever mechanism that it needs to log into that particular database. Okay, so again, uh, this is kind of a simplified API request. It probably doesn't look like that, but you kind of get the gist of what's happening. My application uses those dynamic credentials that we generated, and I'm allowed to connect to that database until the TTL expires, or I can renew those credentials uh, in the event that that's allowed in my workflow. And once again, here's just kind of an overview diagram of what we've covered here for uh, the dynamic database workflow. Okay, so another key piece that we typically find customers sort of aligning behind is the Vault PKI workflow. So if you need certificates, either for doing point-to-point -point encryption between your apps or even for authentication methods, Vault PKI is a wonderful way of doing that. So this is kind of interesting. Um, so I have Kubernetes as sort of the source environment for our A application. And then I have our B application uh, running inside of Nomad. Interestingly enough, uh, this is actually something that uh, one of our specific unnamed video game clients uses. Uh, they run both Kubernetes and Nomad inside their environments, and they're able to connect their applications between environments using secure communication, uh, using the PKI permanence there. So again, very similar. Uh, I'm gonna present a JOT token uh, to the application itself. That application is going to log into Vault using that JOT token. And then Vault is going to verify the JOT system uh, with the token verify API uh, within Kubernetes. The next step, of course, is that Vault is going to distribute a token. In this particular case, um, you see the path that I have down below uh, is, like, is like this PKI Mesh 42 cert with a TTL of 60 minutes. And so one really powerful concept behind the PKI primitives inside of Vault is that you can set very, very low TTL numbers well below that 60 minute example. And so I, I just wanna pause on this point because what this actually does is it changes the way that you can do, that you do certificate revocations. Uh, so certificate revocation windows are usually something on the order of days or weeks long. And if you have, a, if you have very short TTLs on your certificates, in a lot of senses, you can probably just remove the need to do any kind of remediation of those particular tickets uh, if you're in an ITAM kind of world. So something to think about, another thing that's really good to know is that uh, the Vault agent will automatically renew these certificates for you. And 
again, just something to think about uh, if you if you want to have a very very if you want to have very very small windows of capabilities and certificates, the renewal capabilities within the Vault agent can help you out there. So once again, uh, this pattern should look pretty familiar. I'm going to use that token to request a certificate from this particular endpoint. And the other sort of interesting thing here is that the endpoint is going to give me a certificate from there. But because I've authenticated with Vault through my authentication methods, we don't require a public, a public certificate signing process, right? You just log into Vault. And if you log into Vault, you get a certificate. Um, I don't have to go out there and create a local certificate, have it signed by Vault and sent back. It's just automatically going to create that for you. And unless you specify it, it's going to keep the private key locally. You can export the private key, uh, but for the most part, you have some flexibility in either keeping it inside a vault or returning it back to the system. Again, uh, for folks that actually need, uh, that need to actually do the decryption, you'll probably want that private cert on your endpoints themselves. Okay, great. So now that I have my certificate, I can just uh, do my request back and forth. And I didn't specify an API call in this diagram, but imagine that some kind of communication is happening between these elements, uh, where again, this is a super, this is super popular these days, uh, actually providing the certificates for your service mesh. So if you're using console as a service mesh, for instance, uh, you can actually reach out to Vault and have it manage the certs for you. Uh, but it doesn't have to be console. It could be Istio, it could be Linkerd, it could be any of the rest of the tools that are out there. Uh, but if you want Vault to be the central authority for your PKI, PKI certs, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, we also have integrations with vendors like Benefy. So if you want to distribute publicly facing PC, PKI certificates or TLS certs for your websites or whatnot, uh, we can actually wrap the API flows through Vault and then reach out to those external vendors to grab those publicly signed or uh, CA signed certificates. And that sort of translates to getting that green lock on your applications and to, to meet those types of needs. Okay. Cool. So again, just closing out on an overview uh, of the PKI workflow that we have right here. And then we really have just one more use case to discuss. And this is the concept where Vault is offloading encryption as a service for any of your transactions. And again, uh, we have very high throughput systems, specifically banking customers that run every single credit card transaction through this process and they encrypt the data on the fly. And so it's extremely high performance uh, if you have a high performance architecture that's uh, set up for you. So in this particular case, uh, we're going back to an application on AWS using Active Directory, LDAP, or something along those lines in this, the case of this diagram, Active Directory. And it's going to do some encryption as a service through Vault and write that data to the user pass protected side on B. So, I'm going to go through the authentication workflow for B because we've, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through that auth, auth workflow because we've already gone through that several times. Uh, but just imagine that we've gone through, we've gotten our token for authentication, uh, we've logged into the B endpoint, and now we're going to read and write data from those particular endpoints. So again, this should look familiar. I'm going to authenticate with Vault using my AD credentials. Vault is going to verify that identity. And I'm going to get a token that reads from my transform endpoint in this case. Transform is our uh, format preserving encryption technology. And in this particular case, we're going to be encoding social security numbers because PII data is good to protect. Okay, so the application, once it gets its token is going to say, I want to transform the social security number. It's going to send the input data for that particular SSN uh, as part of the payload in the token, uh, uh, as part of the payload. Uh, and the vault token to authenticate as well. Okay, cool. So what vault's going to do then is it's going to do that format preserving encryption and it's gonna change that social security number so that what you end up writing to your actual database or whatever data store um, that you have is tokenized. And if somebody breaks into your database, uh, dumps all this data out, all they're going to get is a bunch of tokenized data that isn't going to be extremely useful for them. So then, uh, of course, once I've sort of returned that data back to my application, now my application can go out and update the social security number. So in this particular case, this is just kind of highlighting uh, what that first step is. 
I have social security numbers inside of my database. I'm going to update that particular social security number to be the tokenized version of it uh, of itself. Uh, and then from here on out, you probably just use the tokenized version. So I'll leave the entire process uh, for transform up here as I go through a bit of an encryption as a service lecture. So starting with how the reverse is also true. Uh, we have an encode process that we just showed. Uh, there's a decode process as well. So if you need to pull data out of there and present it to your users, say inside of their web interface, those capabilities are there. Now, remember that encryption as a service has many other functions as well. So I'm talking through format preserving encryption because I find folks with static databases don't want to increase their column lengths uh, to use any kind of other encryption algorithms that might create much longer encrypted strings. And so if you have a need to keep those database columns static, you can use, like in this case, uh, format preserving encryption. If you can modify your database stores and can use longer strings inside of there, uh, you can use the basic transit operations. Uh, and probably just as, just as equally important for anybody who's uh, doing development work, as, as you're developing your work, uh, you can also send code signing requests to Vault. And so much like we're encrypting the data sources that are here, we can also do sign operations. Uh, so if you're looking for a way to sign your applications as you're uh, running them through your CI CD pipelines or something along those lines uh, to help you lock down your zero trust initiatives, that capability, that workflow is very similar. Um, the major difference is you're just gonna be sending a slightly different payload to Vault and using a different endpoint. Uh, but all the keys are managed within Vault and as long as you can log in and have access to the keys, you get these operations. Um, the last piece I want to em emphasize is why this is highly performant. Uh, to contrast, uh, write operations inside a vault are typically expensive because you have to verify that the writes are there first. Uh, if you're doing replication, you have to verify the uh, you have to verify the writes uh, actually end up on the distant end. But with encryption as a service. All of these encryption, op encryption operations are just reading a key and actually performing the encryption. So it's not writing any kind of data to Vault. And again, these operations are highly, highly performant. Um, we have customers that are doing millions of transactions a month uh, with Transform uh, with their encryption as a service. And uh, for now, that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you have a better understanding of four of our core zero trust use cases within Vault. Thank you.